Thank you, production team. Your support throughout this session has been commendable. And um, thank you so much. Um, okay, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here with you all today. My name is Elena Giannini, and I'm one of the Learning and Development Working Group co-leads at the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. Um, I am joined today by an amazing panel of speakers, and I would like just to progress through introducing them one by one. So, Ayla, would you like to go first and introduce yourself to the, the participants? Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Ayla Bonfilio. I'm the head of the Mixed Migration Centers, Eastern and Southern Africa, Egypt and Yemen office. Very nice to be with you all this afternoon. Calling in from Nairobi. Thank you, Ayla. Amazing. Edward, would you like to go next? Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Eddie Oldwyer. I'm the senior uh, situation coordinator here, based in Tunis, uh, in the office of the special envoy for the Central and Western Mediterranean, the UNHCR office of the special envoy. And so um, covering those countries, you can see behind me on that map. So very pleased to be here uh, with you all. Thank you, Edward. And from the other side of the world, Catalina, would you like to go next? Muy buenos días a todos y todos. Catalina Fernández, especialista protección de UNICEF, oficina regional para América Latina y el Caribe y co-líder del subgrupo regional de protección de la niñez en el accionar humanitario. Gracias, Catalina. Thank you. Uh, Sara, your turn, please. Un saludo muy especial. Mi nombre es Sara Cristina Lara. Eh, junto a Catalina, lideramos el subgrupo regional de protección de la niñez y hago parte de World Peace. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you, Sara. Just, I should have perhaps said this before, there is interpretation available in Spanish for this session. I would strongly recommend you rename yourself with NSP for Spanish at the beginning of your name so that the production team can easily uh, spot that you're a Spanish speaker and that you need interpretation. If you don't know how to do that, uh, you can also uh, write in the chat to the production team directly saying, I'm a Spanish speaker and they will rename uh, yourself with this tag so that we make sure that uh, you get the interpretation as needed or you get into breakout room with interpretation as needed. Okay, I would like to also invite all of the participants to introduce themselves in the chat um, uh, with your name, your organizations, where you're joining us from and uh, getting uh, and get started also with the theme of this session, which is um, um, Certainly very interesting. So we're going to be talking about children on the move today, and we're going to have like these uh, uh, contributions from research that have been conducted, like on the Venezuela crisis and uh, for the Central Mediterranean routes. The number of children on the move, including refugees and displaced children, is ever increasing, and this is putting obviously huge pressures on governments, communities, and also. NGOs or humanitarian agencies more broadly that uh, work to protect them. At every stage of the journey, certainly children on the move face um, a different set of vulnerabilities and challenges. So I would like to um, start with a quick Mentimeter exercise if the production team can assist me by sharing the Menti link in the chat by asking you all um, along which max, uh, sorry, along which mixed movement routes are you working or in which locations and countries. So I'm curious to know if you have uh, been engaged with the programming on children on the move. And if you can type your answer in the Menti link that has been shared or in the chat directly if you prefer. Okay, so we have Central to North America corridor, Guatemala through Mexico and the United States. Yes, in Cali, Colombia, Mediterranean, Afghan, EU, Central Asia and regional, Venezuela migrants in Colombia, Ecuador and Peru and accompanied and separated children in the Central of America, Mediterranean Sea refugees, Italy, 
Greece, um, Venezuela response, but also the Balkan route and the Ukraine crisis, of course, um, the Eastern route to Gulf, Southern route to South Africa. So plenty of different contexts. And I see that there is also some participants input in the, in the chat um, working in Timor Leste. Wonderful. So I wanted all to send ourselves like on the theme of the session. And I would like now to ask basically for uh, an introduction to the research that has been conducted and the findings on the vulnerabilities uh, for children on the move from our speakers today. And I'm gonna start with um, Sarah. Sarah, would you like to um, come forward and present your research a bit? Muchas gracias, Elena. Eh, Thank you. Bueno, nuevamente me presento. Mi nombre es Sara, co-líder del Subgrupo Regional de Protección a la Niñez en América Latina. Eh, desde el año 2019 venimos acompañando eh, la migración venezolana, que es una de las más grandes movimientos eh, que ha habido en la región. Eh, y en el año 2022 hicimos este informe que describe a nivel regional los impactos de la doble afectación a niñas, niños y adolescentes, refugiados y migrantes, particularmente los no acompañados y separados de Venezuela. Eh, para este caso tomamos tres países eh, que tienen un alto flujo de población venezolana, que son Brasil, Colombia y Ecuador. Eh, hicimos énfasis en los territorios de frontera y hemos definido la doble afectación como un contexto de violencia generado por la presencia de grupos armados ilegales y estructuras de crimen organizado, así como otras situaciones de vulnerabilidad a las que se enfrentan eh, las niñas, niños y adolescentes por la falta de garantía de sus derechos, incluyendo la protección especial eh, en un contexto de migración. Entonces queremos compartir con ustedes algunas de las situaciones encontradas en este estudio eh, donde se refleja una visión adultocéntrica de la población eh, una afectación de orden patriarcal, jerárquico, que instrumentaliza a la niñez no acompañada o separada de acuerdo a los objetivos del crimen organizado o de grupos armados. Ahí vemos cómo hay diferentes formas de explotación, abuso, involucramiento en actividades ilícitas, otros delitos y una vulneración a sus derechos, por ejemplo, a la vida, la libertad, la integridad, la dignidad o el libre desarrollo de su personalidad. Podemos avanzar en la diapositiva, por favor. Este, este estudio ha reflejado también eh, que las situaciones de riesgo que han sido derivadas de la doble afectación han aumentado en el marco de la pandemia. Una de las razones de este incremento es que la prestación de servicios de asistencia y atención en esas zonas de frontera eh, se vio disminuida. Y además, el cierre de fronteras incrementó el paso por puntos irregulares donde operan muchos actores ilegales que van desde bandas delincuenciales hasta redes transnacionales de crimen organizado o grupos armados no estatales, como es el caso de Colombia. Entonces, eh, seguimos adelante, por favor. Tenemos algunos perfiles de niñas, niños y adolescentes no acompañados o separados que han sido eh, identificados en nuestro estudio. En general, podemos ver que los niños y niñas que están eh, en tránsito o en condición migratoria, eh, pero que permanecen en una situación irregular, son más vulnerables a este tipo de violencia. Eh, son niños y niñas que carecen de redes de apoyo, que muchas veces han sido invisibilizados porque no se registra su trayecto, su presencia en los diferentes territorios. Algunos de ellos son indígenas, están en situación de calle, tienen perfiles de discriminación múltiple por género, etnia, edad. Eh, además, son niños y niñas que están des desescolarizados, eh, que no cuentan con información fiable sobre los lugares de tránsito o de destino y que mmm, ya venían con un perfil de vulnerabilidad desde su país de origen. En ese gran universo de niñas y niños que están en esta condición de vulnerabilidad, hacemos un foco en los niños y niñas eh, adolescentes no acompañados o separados, que por lo general son adolescentes que buscan ingresos, 
eh, que han sido o se han convertido en proveedores de sus familias, principalmente en el país de origen. Muchos de estos casos son niños y niñas que están a cargo de otros niños, eh, por ejemplo, de sus hermanos más pequeños o que han conformado un nuevo núcleo familiar eh, y a pesar de tener pues, una edad eh, muy temprana para conformar esa familia, eh, están a cargo ahora de sus hermanos o de sus hijos y tienen que actuar eh, de esta forma para su subsistencia. También son adolescentes que han quedado al cuidado de familiares o de otras personas en el país de origen. Con esto nos referimos a los niños dejados de atrás, eh, pero que han empezado una ruta para la reunificación familiar, muchas veces sin compañía. Eh, son niñas, niños y adolescentes cuya trayectoria vital evidencia que la situación de vida en la calle desde su país de origen o de tránsito y que tienen experiencia en algunos casos de consumo de sustancias psicoactivas que más adelante veremos también que eh, son motivadas incluso por los grupos armados para la manipulación de estos adolescentes eh, que en consecuencia son adolescentes en conflicto con la ley y que desafortunadamente han sido vinculados o reclutados por estructuras criminales en los países de origen, tránsito o destino. Eh, desafortunadamente, al estar en conflicto con la ley, no siempre son considerados como víctimas. Eh, se da un tratamiento inadecuado de estos adolescentes por parte del sistema de responsabilidad penal adolescente de los diferentes países eh, y no se reconoce que requieren entrar en el sistema de protección de los países de acogida eh, con medidas de cuidado que sean adaptadas a sus necesidades eh, y que también respondan efectivamente eh, a las necesidades de ellos y, y de sus familias. Eh, como lo mencionábamos, dentro de este grupo también hay mujeres adolescentes que están en situación de matrimonio infantil. Algunas de ellas son gestantes o lactantes. Eh, hay parejas de adolescentes en uniones tempranas. Eh, y muchos de ellos víctimas de tráfico, trata de personas y como medida de autoprotección en ocasiones viajan juntos, eh, no teniendo siempre un lugar de destino eh, fijado con anterioridad, incluso se trasladan de país a país eh, de manera continuada. Eh, Seguimos, por favor. Bien, algunos de los riesgos a los que están expuestos es ser víctimas de trata o tráfico de personas o eh, de trata con fines de explotación sexual o laboral. Y ahí vemos también un impacto diferenciado para los niños y para las niñas. Eh, las niñas, eh, digamos, tienen una mayor tendencia a ser explotadas sexualmente y los niños están eh, siendo explotados según las peores formas de trabajo infantil, lo hemos visto, por ejemplo, en la extracción de hidrocarburos, de minerales, pero también eh, en estas labores, por ejemplo, en Colombia, donde tienen que raspar las hojas de coca. Eh, entonces, estas son las, las formas, como vemos, que han sido explotados eh, según su género. Eh, también son víctimas de adopciones ilegales. Eh, han sido involucrados en actividades ilícitas asociadas a la producción o tráfico de estupefacientes. Eh, esto genera un fenómeno muy común entre las bandas delincuenciales o los grupos armados, donde los niños y niñas que han sido eh, utilizados son fácilmente reemplazados por otros niños, eh, lo que resta valor ¿no? a, a sus vidas, sus derechos, eh, porque el interés del grupo, pues por supuesto, es confinante de esas actividades ilícitas. Eh, ser víctimas de violencia de género eh, también están expuestos al uso o utilización por parte de grupos armados, a ser víctimas de extorsiones, amenazas, intimidaciones, persecuciones a ellos y a sus familias. Eh, y un fenómeno que también es de difícil eh, denuncia es ser víctimas de desaparición forzada, de homicidios o de desplazamiento forzado. Eh, asimismo, son víctimas de minas antipersonales, incluso se han convertido en reclutadores o son reclutados por otros adolescentes y como decíamos anteriormente, no son reconocidos como víctimas por diversos delitos. Entonces, hasta aquí vamos a compartir por ahora algunos de estos hallazgos. Eh, no sé si tal vez mi compañera quiere agregar algo sobre lo que hemos 
eh, encontrado en nuestro estudio. No, Sara, de momento has completado todo. Adelante. Gracias. Gracias, Elena. Adelante. Gracias, Sara. That was um, really interesting and at the same time, um, you know, sad, sad to hear the complexities of like the situation of children along this route. But I would like to leave the floor to Ayla uh, to hear about your research and vulnerabilities finding that you have um, uncovered through your study. Please, Ayla, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Elena. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, while we wait for the presentation to be loaded, here we see, we can already proceed to the next slide. So today I'll be presenting some findings on child, uh, well, findings on, on the experiences of children and youth on the move along the central Mediterranean route, uh, focusing in on where we conducted the research in Sudan and in Tunisia. And I'd like to split it into to two parts because we, we set out first having to to build what we thought was a child sensitive uh, approach um, within the research and how, how do you conduct research with children in, in an appropriate and sensitive way. And so on the screen, you see uh, the beginnings are of, uh, of our approach, which I, which I will now outline. Um, so first recognizing that uh, quantitative instruments are not the most sensitive when dealing with children because they are highly structured. They don't allow for you to, to adapt based on uh, cues that a child might be giving you that they're uncomfortable with a question um, or that they might need uh, rephrasing or a new question should be asked. And so we we restricted our quantitative uh, survey uh, data collection to adults traveling with children in their care and youth over the age of 18. And so with caregivers, we were able to, to talk with them about the children in their care, what their care arrangements were like, uh, their household vulnerabilities, the perceptions of um, their perceptions of, of risks that, that children were exposed to, um, experiences or uh, access to, uh, to education. Um, and then with youth, we were really looking at their direct experiences, um, their support networks, their livelihoods and exploitation uh, that they might have experienced along the route. And so we developed really targeted, more age sensitive modules for these two groups. Um, it's a way of kind of asking around. And I, I should point out that a lot of the youth that we interviewed had started their journeys before they reached the age of 18. So that's something we also learned through the course of this research. You see um, about 10% in Tunisia. And then we used qualitative methods when, uh, when talking directly with children of different care statuses. So that's accompanied children or unaccompanied and separated children. And so taking these three groups together was really how we envisioned um, how to, to, to collect data on the experiences of children. So when we get to the feedback room, uh, the breakout rooms, it would be great to, to see how do other organizations uh, and, and researchers go about uh, doing this. Next slide, please. So the one more note on this uh, approach that we that we used is it's not just about identifying a sampling frame or different data sources, but we also had to identify child sensitive interview tools, uh, contextually appropriate consent protocols, uh, data protection protocols, critical incident support. So when someone seemed like they were in trouble, even though we were already at uh, an, an assistance provider who had a direct relationship with the child, but if there was some uh, critical incident that needed to be addressed immediately, we had these, these kinds of protocols in place. And then when it comes to the youth and the caregivers whom we interviewed, you can see on the screen their age, their status in the country, the different um, sampling criteria that we had. And we asked people really about their, their profiles, but also what routes that they took, their aspirations, uh, vulnerabilities, uh, different questions related to the minors traveling within their care, care arrangements, their aspirations to, to reunite with families. So our intention really was not to just count or get an, a, a sense of the extent, but really to delve into experiences and, and perceptions, I think, which is really, really crucial and which can inform program design. Next slide. So 
So we'll delve now into findings. So any feedback on the approach would be great. Um, and now if we turn to look at what we found and all of these, uh, the findings are published on online or are about to be if they're not, but for, for caregivers, they are online. Um, if we asked first care, caregivers how many children were in their care. And among the respondents whom we interviewed in Sudan, uh, the largest group, so more than 50% said four to six children and 9% had said seven or more children. So that's well over 60% of children, uh, of caregivers who are traveling with, with more than um, with more than four children in their care. In Tunisia, it was slightly less, but still we see um, people traveling on the whole with um, two or more children in their care. Next slide. 86% of those that we interviewed in, in Sudan were the sole caregivers and 92% um, of those we interviewed in Tunisia were the sole caregivers, which is striking. Um, and then we saw some interesting differences. And I think this stems from where Sudan and Tunisia are respectively along the central Mediterranean route. Sudan is much closer to places of origin and earlier on in the journeys, whereas Tunisia is, is much later on um, if people end up taking the Mediterranean crossing at all. So in Sudan, um, much of, most of the respondents started their journeys with children, whereas we saw a, a more uh, a higher share of people in Tunisia who reported that children were born along the route or care arrangements began along the route. And this is really important to consider because it shows how people's care arrangements can change over time. And, and more than half of uh, or just about half of people in, in Sudan, about a third in Tunisia, were traveling with at least one child that was not their son or daughter. So we see the complexity of care arrangements here. And then if we think about livelihoods, we see how just 42% had a source of income in Sudan versus 80%. So if we combine all these factors together um, and, we, and we consider the findings from the previous slide on the number of children that people are traveling with, it gives us a, quite a realistic sense of how complex and vulnerable that certain, um, that certain caregivers are uh, and the needs that they have and, um, and, 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 and gives us some indication of what, what's necessary from the programming side to consider. Next slide. I'm conscious of time, so I will uh, I will be quick here. But I'd like to emphasize. So we we asked uh, we asked uh, youth what their perceptions or what risks do youth face in your current location. So on the left, people are speaking about the risks that they perceive facing in Sudan, and on the right in Tunisia. And the main takeaway here is that people are experiencing multiple risks, which create like multiple uh, protection concerns and challenges. We also see key differences, uh, not surprisingly in terms of gender, where for instance, sexual violence is perceived as a risk more for women. Although of course this can also be due to some of the cultural biases against uh, men uh, reporting uh, sexual violence as a, as a potential risk for them. We also see some key differences in location and we see on the whole that there's a higher perception of risk in, in Sudan. And we see if some more, let's say, gendered um, uh, differences in Tunisia. So for some of these risks we followed up, you'll see on the screen that we have the perceived risk of forced work or labor exploitation. In Sudan, across the board, uh, domestic work was seen as uh, the most precarious sector of work in terms of forced work for youth, whereas in Tunisia, that was the case for, for women respondents or women youth, but, um, but for men it was in the construction sector. Next slide. We asked uh, youth if there was an emergency, who would we, you reach out to? Because it's important to also understand who are youth to, turning to? What are their existing support networks? And interestingly, in Sudan, it was very much about people in their current location, whereas support networks for our Tunisian respondents were outside of the country, whether it's relatives in their country of origin or country destination. I won't uh, repeat all of them for time, but it's important to emphasize here that um, we need to know what existing support networks are so programming can see what are the, what are the networks we should be fostering uh, or facilitating. Next slide, which is my last slide. 
assistance needs. Uh, again, a key message here is about the multiple needs that youth uh, and also children have. Uh, and you can see them here on the screen. So all the interviewed youth uh, whom we interviewed in Sudan reported needing assistance. And this, this was the case for 91% of the people that we, that we interviewed in Tunisia. And you can see the top five uh, forms of assistance that you said they need right now uh, versus those expressed by children. And you can see some key differences in terms of, of education or child or daycare. Um, but you also see the presence of, of, uh, of some basic needs here, which is key. So not just child specific needs, but, but, but very much basic needs as well. But we are all looking at humanitarian contexts. Thanks very much, Elena. And I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Ayla, and also for being so mindful of Panda, which is like so appreciated. Um, very interesting. It's also giving me a lot of food for thought, like listening what uh, Sarah had mentioned about the, the double affectation and now all of this information about different contexts such as Sudan and Tunisia, super interesting. Um, just a note for the participants, do, do flag any uh, question you might have in the chat. I'll try to keep up a record of those so we can ask those at the end if we have a little bit of time. Um, but before we get to that, um, I would like to ask um, the speakers, and in this case, Edward first, the reflections stemming from this research on actually working with children on the move. And um, yeah, Edward, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think I'm waiting for the slides to come on. There's a few more slides yeah. there. I could just talk to those when they come. But just let me start by, by opening to say that I'm very pleased to be here today uh, at the Alliance with MMC, uh, a really valued partnership that has been developing over, over the last couple of years in particular. Um, and it's going to get more important because research certainly in this area of child protection is going to inform us all, I think, in a very complex period ahead of us. Um, right now, I think UNHCR this morning announced, or last night announced, that uh, there are 108 million uh, displaced people in the world today. It's the highest ever. So there's a new figure for everybody in the room. And um, if that's a vast problem, child protection within that, within that amount of, uh, of people is also a vast problem. Now, I suppose the word there is don't, dis don't let's uh, get discouraged. And I see that people from all over the world are here. We have the Americas and all of the problems that are coming up uh, from, from, you know, from, from, from South America to Central Americas and, and the Asia. We heard on the BBC this morning, the Afghan, some horrific stories from Afghan uh, men being trafficked and families being held for ransom. So, I mean, children inside in, that, in, in those contexts are in such a, such a difficult uh, situation. So, you know, it's, it's research is going to help us understand our, our, um, our environment and understand more about what responses we're going to be uh, collectively uh, to, to bring to bear on that. Um, just on, so on the first slide, um, the, it's, it's about uh, research, I understand. Maybe we're after jumping, yeah. So, so the first one is on research. And, and there, the reflection is that, um, with MMC, we, we embarked on some earlier um, research projects like uh, uh, tracking the abuses on the route in the Mediterranean. And that was published in, in 2020, and that showed where the abuses were happening and who was being abused. And, the, and, and children came out, of, uh, came out very strongly out of that report as being the, the, one of the most vulnerable groups. Then in 2021, there was a policy workshop, and I will, I'll drop it in the chat for you. Um, uh, and I just encourage people to take a look at that. I think that's the right link. But take a look at that policy workshop. And that policy workshop uh, involved many, a lot of people, uh, academics and people from external, from UNCR and MMC, but it guides us today. And from that policy workshop, this, this, um, that inspired this research that, that uh, has been undertaken in the last year. The message there is that I think um, in the context of the Global Refugee Forum, in the context of the union of the, the partnership between Africa and the Europeans, uh, in the context of the Rabat process, in the context of the Khartoum process, the, the, the Joint Valletta Plan of Action, research is going to inform 
how these things move forward. And I'm, I, I, you know, I'm placing you into the central Mediterranean situation right now as we we're 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 um, we're talking. There's a, a very uh, active conversation between the Europeans, let's say, and Tunisia at the moment, but also other North African countries, on on how best to have a joined up plan together to to address some of these challenges. And child and youth protection are first and foremost in that. Um, more targeted research will be needed. Uh, we will need to be addressing, has been addressed already, but the intentions of different groups, child and youth, the, the protection risks involved, the services available at different parts of the route. And there are, there are other pilot projects and Lampedusa, there's another one coming up in terms of actually tracking the routes that people can. So hopefully using biometric research there. Um, Yesterday, I, we, we just had a, a chat with MMC. We're going to be looking at climate. We're going to be looking more at conflict, how that mixes in with, with economics and social factors. That's going to be the new agenda, which is going to help us respond to this massive Sudan emergency, for instance. So that's just coming on your screens now. Next slide, please. Right, we enforce referral of children in more border areas. This, this is... Um, this is part of a route-based approach. It's also linked to another slide you'll see in a minute about, about joining up cities and secondary cities. Uh, this is places like, on, on this road, I'm going to mention areas, Dongola in Northern Sudan, Asamaka in Northern, uh, in, in, in Northern Niger. These are places close to borders where, where people pass from one country to another. And there are very few services out in these areas. How do you get there? It's partnerships. The, 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 the reflection is we can't be all out there in these remote areas. We don't have the money, the resources, and it's very difficult to get there. So we need to be working with the people who are there, and we need to be capacitate them and have the partnerships that, that, that we can, that we can uh, work in those remote locations with them. Next slide, please. It's linked to the same uh, conversation. So there's a lot going on in the world with cities. There's a cities forum everywhere uh, and, and they're very interactive. They're wonderful uh, fora for dialogue and indeed uh, uh, ourselves and MMC are involved in them uh, with the Afri cities and, and, uh, and, um, and, and all of the partners, wonderful partners that are in there. The, the, the problem and the challenge with this is joining those people up in a cohesive dialogue. So these are, these are, these are all happening, but um, these, these are all happening, but, but the, 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 the conversations and, and the action of the participants in those, in those fora are not joined up uh, uh, in, in a cohesive set of actions. We tried something at the Afro cities to try and get a, a pilot sort of dialogue going with, on a route-based approach with the mayor from this town and the mayor from this town and the next town, to, in different countries joined up to talk to each other about common, uh, uh, about common challenges. We were not able to do it, but we're not stopping. We're going to, we're, we're going to try it more. UNICR right now at the moment is implementing a pilot project starting in the central Mediterranean, coming down to Tunisia, Algeria, and going towards West Africa. And necessarily, we are going to have to join up those remote areas, and we're going to have to join up those teams. Just keep your eye on that, I suppose, on this space. And the research agenda is going to help inform how we program that. Next slide, please. Alternative care arrangements. So the, this, is the, this is the discussion we have. We're talking about child protection. We're talking about uh, care arrangements. And UNHCR, for many, many years in this theater here, has had many different initiatives, the most recent of which was called the Live, Learn and Participate Initiative. And that was with the European Union under the old trust fund. And it was in, in, in Egypt, in, in Libya, in Tunisia, or in uh, Sudan and Ethiopia. And there, that was trying to reinforce, um, identify first of all, families that would act as foster fa families or other alternative care arrangements, maybe some centers as the lesser of all evils if there was no other solution to have a center for children and then to, to bring cash-based assistance and other assistance and try and link that up with, 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 with solutions. 
we, we tried that. that, that project ended. All I'm saying there is the message is more of that needs to be done, uh, especially in the new environment with this new displacement, the amounts of displacement. Uh, UNHCR alone can't do all of that. It, it, our, our small efforts need, need to be, uh, you need a coalition of partners there to engage in this. And, and, and I suppose that's the message through all of these findings. Next, please. Uh, increase awareness among, among refugees and, 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 and children and youth. So we would point you to a, a, a very interesting initiative that uh, UNHCR started up with people on the move themselves many years ago, telling the real story. It is a platform whereby people uh, come in and give their testimonies, whereby UNHCR and partners actually put messages out there and engage with communities, with diaspora, and tell the real story of what's going on on the routes. They, you know, people come in, people who have traveled, who have been to Europe and come back and can tell the people in their own village what happened and what to, you know, don't go, please. If you go, uh, this, you're likely to, 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 uh, you know, to face these risks. That is something that we would hope to expand across the continent if we can. And your support with, with that, uh, I get my colleagues to share that with you, would, would be very useful. But CWC strategies are necessary and all of the tools you have available are necessary. We have them in MENA, we have them in Libya, in Tunisia, over in West Africa. Those messaging, the messaging modalities are in play. The hotlines are in play. All the WhatsApp, all of the mechanisms uh, you can imagine are in play to try and pass the message and still people will travel on the routes and they will still take risks. That's part of human nature, but you can try to save lives at least through this mechanism of CWC. It is so important, at least try. I mean, just, to, just since so far on the central med, we have a thousand people dead at sea. That's not to talk about people on land. So this is a next, hugely important area, more of that. Next slide, please. Legal pathways. Legal pathways strategically, uh, OECD countries say that family reunification I mean, it's, it's partial data, but if OECD countries say family reunification uh, in the last uh, 20 and 21 uh, was far bigger than resettlement. I think there was over a, a, a 1 million cases of family reunification uh, and resettlement. Strategically, UNHCR is looking out to 2030 uh, with the SDGs and saying that legal pathways have to, have to outgrow resettlement. That's the plan. If you listen to European uh, uh, protection dialogues, migration dialogues in Vienna last year, people, European Union says legal pathways and the member states are saying, we need legal pathways so as we can avoid irregular pathways, illegal pathways. So we don't want illegal ones, we want legal ones. The problem is that the, the rhetoric is one thing, but the action is not, is not keeping speed with that. And, and this is an area where I think we all need to feed in with research and action to try and uh, and, and and support that uh, initiative, though that direction as well. Last next slide, please, or is that the last one? Yeah, that may be the last one. Yeah, it was the last one. I yeah. Okay, so those are just summary, summary, summary comments. Uh, I kept it rather general, but you know. Uh, Displacement is really, it, it, it's not getting better, it's getting more challenging. Thanks, Edward. And uh, Rua and uh, yourself have shared a lot of resources in the chat that I think can be definitely picked up upon by our participants to further explore the research, the results, the findings, etc. But now I would like to leave the floor to Catalina uh, to hear. Uh, your reflections on the findings of your research and on working on children on the move in the Venezuela uh, crisis. Over to you, Catalina. Thank you. Gracias, Elena. Y creo que tengo que comenzar diciendo de que muchas de las recomendaciones que Edward acaba de mencionar, pues se reflejan también a partir de nuestro estudio de doble afectación, doble afectación y crimen organizado en la población migrante y refugiada venezolana. 
niños, niñas y adolescentes. Como verán, tenemos y creemos que es ciertamente la generación de evidencia sobre los riesgos a los cuales los niños, niñas y adolescentes están inmersos a través de la ruta. Creo que alguien en el chat ponía o ponía algún comentario de que para la crisis venezolana o la crisis de migración y refugiada venezolana era importante el tema de niñez no acompañada y separada y cómo reforzamos, pues sí, efectivamente eso no, se, no generó uno de los resultados y una de las recomendaciones a partir de este estudio es seguir generando esa evidencia que nos permita también poder visualizar los riesgos que se tienen, que se tienen a través de la ruta y recordando también un poco de que el flujo migratorio venezolano lo podemos tener desde el sur hasta el, hasta el norte del continente americano y viceversa también pues cruzando cruzando océanos de por otro lado la segunda recomendación o reflexión que sale a partir del estudio de los ter, de los tres países como Sara anteriormente nos menciona es el poder incrementar los esfuerzos de identificación, de cuidado, de protección para prevenir esos riesgos, que va mucho de la mano en cómo trabajamos en esa articulación, en esa coordinación interinstitucional dentro de las diferentes localidades en donde tenemos. Y aquí considerando también y algo de lo que se refleja en el estudio es la, o sea, el poder considerar las diferentes etapas de la ruta migratoria, no solo considerando fronteras, sino también durante el tránsito, pero al mismo tiempo, cómo esta doble afectación se puede dar en las comunidades de acogida o en el destino. Y es allí donde nos permite también poder identificar, o sea, la necesidad de que sigamos trabajando desde los actores de protección de una manera articulada interinstitucional en esa identificación temprana, en ese fortalecimiento de nuestras acciones para poder prevenir los riesgos, el cual va de la mano con la tercera recomendación. No solo nos hace falta prevenir, y, y, sino también el fortalecer nuestros servicios durante toda la ruta. ¿Cómo podemos fortalecer? de la mano con los sistemas de protección de la niñez que tenemos a lo largo de los diferentes países de la región en donde necesitamos seguir fortaleciendo nuestros servicios, nuestras intervenciones, pero acorde a los perfiles a los que Sara mencionó al principio. El poder también la, se ha identificado los diferentes perfiles a los cuales están viendo afectados estos niños, estas niñas y adolescentes. En esta doble afectación es importante el poder contar con una especificidad de servicios acordes y pertinentes a, lo cual al mismo tiempo hablamos de niñez en su mayoría y pues según la evidencia que tenemos en el, en el estudio, de niñez y adolescencia no acompañada y o separada, lo cual nos lleva también a que dentro de parte de los servicios que tenemos que fortalecer, pues también tengamos servicios o una determinación del interés superior apropiada con procesos apropiados donde el interés superior efectivamente sea lo que lo que reine dentro de este proceso para ya sea para una reunificación familiar para asegurar el acceso a la justicia para asegurar los procesos o los servicios los servicios inmediatos de protección de la niñez o otros servicios de protección social que es también un poco lo que genera también genera la evidencia genera la evidencia del estudio de cómo nos articulamos más allá de los servicios de protección de la niñez y cómo esta determinación o este proceso de determinación de interés superior del niño o de la niña versa en todas las medidas que posteriormente a esta, a esta persona se le va a dar. Y desde luego tenemos y contamos, como ya vimos en los perfiles, hablamos no solo de niños y niñas adolescentes no acompañados y separados, sino que también víctimas de diferentes tipos de violencias a través de la ruta. Y no solo cuando empiezan su travesía, muchas veces pueden empezar su travesía separados o no acompañados o con sus familias, pero a través de la travesía o de la ruta, que, que atraviesan, puede ser que se vean separados y también se ven, se ven vulnerables ante diferentes manifestaciones de violencia. Y acá tenemos, o sea, y coincidimos un poco con los, con los datos que mencionaban los colegas en cuanto a violencia sexual o violencia basada de género también, que es una de las violencias que más vemos dentro de la ruta, y cómo aseguramos esa asistencia, cómo aseguramos esos, ese acceso a la justicia, pero al mismo tiempo a los servicios inmediatos y apropiados de protección de la niñez durante la ruta, y desde luego la restitución de los derechos cuando hablamos ya de un proceso de acceso a la justicia. Next, please. 
Thanks, Catalina. That's uh, great. And I see that uh, there are a lot of similarities, as you mentioned, with uh, uh, some of the recommendations and reflections from, <coughs> from Edward uh, and his team study. We had arranged for a breakout room session, but I think we have little time. So I prefer to use this time to take any questions that um, may be. Uh, from the audience. And uh, while I wait for um, any participants to come up like with questions like or thoughts or remarks and feel free to raise your hand or drop the question directly in the chat. Like I can pose a couple of questions to speakers as um, of aspects that, uh, oh, I see that there is a lot of, there is already a question. Uh, how are we capturing disaggregated data pertaining children on the move and fill the gap for better programming? I feel maybe uh, Ayla uh, on, and or Sarah, would you, would, you inter would you be interested in answering to that or sharing your thoughts on that? Ayla, I see you nodding, I'll let you go first. Sure. Um, it's a tricky question because, uh, of course, there are d gaps in data, but I think a lot of that stems from how challenging it is to collect uh, to collect data with children on the move. Um, and the kind mm -hmm. of data that's easy to share is quantitative data, of course, but maybe that's not the right kind of data for um, for children on the move, as we as we found. And qualitative data is really difficult to ensure anonymity. Um, and so should that be shared? Um, but but um, but I think there's a broader point to be made here on how important it is to capture uh, age in uh, in data collection and understanding that um, a child is not a single category and that particularly also when we get to the ages of 18 where people also age out it doesn't mean that we shouldn't collect data on them anymore because i think there are some really unique vulnerabilities among uh, among um, young people who have recently turned 18. Um, I would also want to add, I mean, I think just more broadly, I think we could do better on evidence-based programming, but how do care arrangements take in, do I go with a second or I just uh, stick with the first question? Stick with the first, if you don't mind. Great. Uh, we, can take, uh, we can take the other question um as well um catalina i think you wanted to jump in on that one right yes Sí, quizás también un poco en el tema de la data. Sabemos y lo que nos evidencia, nos evidencia el estudio en la región es la necesidad de continuar trabajando en la data administrativa. Y si bien también hay que agregar que en el estudio que hicimos sobre doble afectación, hablamos de niños, niñas y adolescentes no acompañados que posiblemente en su mayoría no son captados desde el principio o identificados desde el principio por los sistemas de protección o por nuestros actores humanitarios o monitores humanitarios en, en las fronteras, sino que más bien son captados, lamentablemente, por las diferentes organizaciones de grupos, de grupos, de grupos armados ilegales. Entonces eso también hace que la invisibilidad que decíamos al principio de los perfiles permea en, en el, durante la generación de data en los estudios. Pero desde luego, una de las recomendaciones que tenemos es el seguir trabajando en, en esta generación de evidencia de esta data administrativa, seguir fortaleciendo los sistemas de protección de una manera articulada e institucional. Y que creo que eso lo uno con una pregunta que hay por allí de Rainier, de cómo seguimos trabajando esos retos interinstitucionales y es cómo partir y seguir fortaleciendo nuestras capacidades. Thank you for reading that question, actually, Catalina. Given that uh, I hope the other speakers have um, been able to listen to the interpretation of that question, would you like to give some thoughts to that element of interinstitutional work? Catalina. Gracias. 
sino también en colaboración con los estados y los diferentes sistemas de protección. Sin embargo, eh, sigue habiendo retos en la atención eh, adecuada y en ser capaces de flexibilizar la atención que estamos brindando para ajustarla a las necesidades que hay eh, y para mejorar siempre en temas de coordinación. Entonces, creo que ese es el mayor reto, poder adaptarse a las necesidades de los adolescentes que están sufriendo esta doble afectación eh, en su condición también de proveedores y de víctimas. Thank you, Sarah, for answering to that. Um, there are lots of questions and lots of ideas. I suggest you can also share speakers your input like in the chat. But I want to leave, uh, um, I want to give the floor to Danielle, who has uh, uh, end up since a little while uh, to share a question. Danielle, would you like to come off mute and share your question? Sure. Thank you so much, Elena. And thank you to our phenomenal speakers. This has been such an interesting and important discussion today. Um, on the heels of this discussion and with the metric of 108 million displaced, I think knowing that this number is only expected to increase exponentially in years to come, I'm curious about knowing more about what's working well and what needs to change um, in light of that. Um. Um, given that we've heard from Sara and Catalina just now, Ayla or Edward, would you like to come into that? I think that's a tough question. <laughs> but uh, um, Edward, I see you unmuted. Maybe you want to come in. Yeah, I mean, uh, what works in terms of child protection or what works in terms of the bigger picture? Just to... um, Within child protection, but within broadly of, of how we're thinking about that and the conversations that we're having um, in the context of children on the move. So the first thing, the first thing I might just reflect that any data for anybody on the move, people on the move, is, is difficult. People in static situations, that's easier. You know, camps you can register, authorities can 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 also register, some of them. Some 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 states have a strategic uh, a policy not to register. It's strategy, it's not a inability. So I mean there's a it, if, if you could get, first of all, a, a, a coherent policy on, 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 on uh, you know, registrating, uh, re registration, uh, everybody on a territory, as states normally do, then that would be good. Then uh, joining that up on a, on a roots-based approach, again, this is the challenge, honestly, uh, it is so difficult to try, ask IOM, DTM, I mean, ask ourselves, ask anybody in, in, that's in, in this business of tracking people, it's so difficult. Now, tracking children is something that that is probably some is probably more visible, and I think there's an opportunity to 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 keep our eyes open for children because you know you have a bigger you have a bigger partnership there, UNICEF there, you have the Save the Children. You have, this coalition of a way that's the wrong word. Uh, the, the, um, this big partnership uh, can actually help, I think, in this. I think now is the moment to answer that question. Now is the moment to do advocacy on that point. And, and, and to put, the, put your hand up for children and say, listen, folks, it, in the context of this new environment where it looks like, if you look at the Sahel and you look at other parts of the world, it looks like displacement is going to grow. You know, If you really do need to, to try and, and do something for children, we need to keep a track of them. I think, I think governments will listen to that. That's not a difficult one to sell. So I think there's a there's an advocacy message that can be there, but then the systems and how to do that, that's a technical discussion, not for today. You can go into a, a breakout room and figure out how that might be done. Thanks, Edward, for that. I think we're at time, unfortunately, but what we will do with those questions that have gone unanswered, like we'll post them like under the Facebook recording and ask our speakers today, Sara, Catalina, Ayla, Edward, um, to actually answer them so that we don't leave you dry. Uh, the time is limited, the, the research are very extensive and certainly to be explored further. Um, and you can continue also the discussion on our social media or on the community of practice. I wanna thank Sara, Catalina, Edward and Ayla uh, thank you, gracias, uh, for being with us here today. It's 
an impressive amount of work that you have been doing and thanks for sharing it with us today.